Amen. Father, thank you for the months and months and months we have enjoyed the book of Daniel. And sadly, it's coming to a conclusion. Bless this Daniel word to us and then get us ready for Gog and Magog understanding. And when Gog and Magog comes, may we not be here. May we all be safely home with the living God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We're going to go from Daniel 13, and then we'll go to Ezekiel, and then we'll do Gog and Magog, and the plan of the... Um, Ezekiel is to follow the Holy Spirit of Pentecost. The dead bones are going to rise again. Then we'll do Ezekiel regains, um, Israel gets all of its land. And the attack of Gog and Magog, the final battle of the end of the world. And then I can say we have really covered everything in the whole scriptures we've covered all the prophesying and now there's only one thing you got to do is to prophesy in the spirit okay so let's go to daniel 13. now daniel 13 is a chapter which the protestants don't have when the bible was translated from the hebrew into the Greek, these chapters appeared. And when they appeared, we have kind of two interesting stories. One of them is about a beautiful woman with great parents, and her name was Shoshana. Shoshana means the lily. We translate it as Susanna. So let's look at Shoshana. It's a story of lust. And remember, those who live in lust are part of the majority of people who will go into a hell-like experience quicker than most people. Lust is the main reason for most people being damned today. So do not ever encounter someone and be with them until you're married with them. If you go with me to verse 44, is when you are accused, when you are accused of doing something evil, this is the hardest thing for you to do to maintain your stability, to maintain your innocence, to maintain your walk in God. Now, are we all going to be accused? Everybody shake your head, yes. Verse 44, the Lord heard her cry, and she was being led away to be put to death. Now, the Romans 6, 23, the, the wages of sin is what? Death. I am innocent of the blood of this woman. As she was being led away to be put to death, God aroused the Holy Spirit of a young man named Daniel. So we can see from chapter 1 of Daniel that Daniel, the judgment of God, is he was incredibly wise. So I am, verse 46, and he cried with a loud voice, I am innocent. Now, when you, when you hear Jesus being tried in Matthew 26, the Jewish people kind of threw dust on themselves and say, let him be put to death. And they were condemning themselves. And that goes back to Deuteronomy 22. Because there they were told, that don't condemn anybody who's innocent. 
Jesus was condemned as innocent by the world of religion and the pressure was on the civil government. So think about it. If you have two powers that are condemning you, you have the power of religion and you have the power of civil government, then you really don't feel too well. All the people turned to him and said, what is this that you have said? Verse 48, taking a stand in the midst of them, he said, are you fools, you sons of Israel? Have you condemned a daughter of, of Israel without examination, without learning the facts? Now, this is the same thing that Nicodemus would encounter. That's why this whole chapter is read during Lent. If you, if you churchgoers go, do not condemn something. Now, when Jesus was condemned to death, when he was condemned, he had to go through five trials. When he was condemned to death, there was about five irregularities. When you put everything down on paper, Jesus should never have been tried. Jesus should have been innocent. Everything they did was super illegal by their own law and by their own system. So, so if you box in there, underline there, verse number 48, 49. Return to the place of judgment, for these men have borne false witness against her. So we're all going to be accused to get ready. Then all the people returned in haste, and the elders said to him, Come sit among us and inform us, for God has given you that right. Again, the power of the wisdom that God has given them, they could see it all over him. And Daniel said to him, separate them from each other, and I will examine them. So, so now they're, they're being taken into two different rooms. So here we go. Here goes the Daniel. This is Daniel really, really living his name, the, the judgment of God. Verse 52, and when they separate from each other, he summoned one of them and said, you old relic of wicked days. Isn't that a great title? You old relic of wicked days. Your sins have now come home, which you committed in the past, pronouncing unjust judgments, condemning the innocent, and letting the guilty go through, through the, though the Lord said, do not put to death an innocent and righteous person. Now righteousness is again the power of God living through you. And so they already taken care of all the particulars before. When they took care of all the particulars before, they knew all the facts before. So now they're going to have to give all the facts. And so Daniel sets them up because of the wisdom that he has from God. Well, go Daniel, go. Don't condemn an innocent person. Now, th then, if, if you really saw her, tell me this. Under what tree did you see them being intimate with each other? And he said, under a mastic tree. Boy, he answered, under a mastic tree. And then Daniel said, verse 55, Very well, you have lied against your own head, for the angel of the Lord has received the sentence from God and will immediately cut you into two. Now the angel, again, the power of the judgment passes from Daniel to the angels. Now this is called the separation of the sheep and the goats. So you can see that right happening right there will cut you into two. I'm reminded that the prophet Isaiah also, when you look at Hebrews chapter 11, Isaiah was sawn in half. So he was under a false judgment under Manasseh. But now the angel will cut you into two. So here they go for their judgment day to be cut by an angel of God. Then he put him aside and commanded verse 56 to bring the other. And he said to him, you offspring of Canaan. Now remember Canaan here. If you circle the word Canaan, the offspring of Canaan, 
it's all the people who lived in the land in the book of Judges. It's all those tribes. In fact, here is a not unknown fact. How many have ever heard of the woman Anna during the Christmas story in Luke chapter two? Anna was from the tribe of Asher and she was right in the offspring of Canaan. Remember Jesus went to rescue the Syrophoenician woman. But how many of you know that Anna was the one that was from the offspring of Kena. And look at verse 56, underlined there, not of Judah. Who came from Judah, everybody? Daniel. Daniel came from Judah. Beauty has deceived you and lust has perverted your heart. So what happens from people living in the Cana area? People living in the Cana area, that's the type of people they were, were lustful filled, perversion of heart. Now you can see why in verse 56, they, God told them to take over that land, that the land did not belong to them because they were deceivers, they were lustful, they were of the Canaanite variety. And this is how, verse 57, um, this is how you've both been dealing with the daughters of Israel. Now, See it, look at verse 7, 57. See it as another attack on Israel from all the book of Judges and all the tribes. So notice that the spirit of the Judges has not really settled out. Who, who are the people that, that really keep attacking? You can see it in Jesus' day. You can see it even in the Pharisees and the Sadducees yelling and screaming, crucify him, crucify him. So you can see that condemnation. So that's why we have this in our Bibles, because it's a story of being condemned. But more importantly, it's a story of being delivered by the Almighty God. Go, God, go, yes. So we got a lot of interesting background there. So you should have underlined the offspring of Cana, not of Judah, because that's Daniel's tribe. We can see in verse 56, their sins of deception, their sins of lust. Verse number 57. This is how you've been dealing with the daughters of Israel. Again, our, our, our friend there, Susanna. What does her name mean? The lily, the pure one. And but a daughter of Judah. So she was Judah too. Notice that Susanna is from the tribe of Jesus. Everybody put that down there. The tribe of Jesus. So can you see now when you hear this in the whole book of um, Daniel, when you hear it during Lent time, and notice nobody explains and shows you the connections. Please note the connections now. But a daughter of Judah would not endure your wickedness. Now then tell me, under what tree did you catch being intimate with each other? He answered, under an evergreen oak. And Daniel said to him, very well, you have also lied against your own head, for the angel of God is waiting for you. Now put, it, put an interesting little note there for yourselves. Does anybody remember two people in the New Testament that lied to God. This is called lying to the Holy Spirit. When you lie to the Holy Spirit, that means you decide I'm gonna do something. Uh, for example, say I got $100,000 in my inheritance. And I said, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna give, I'm gonna tell everybody I'm gonna give $100,000 to the church. Hey, that sounds great. But all of a sudden on the way there, I said, maybe I better keep $10,000. You know, we might need it, so forth. But everybody found out that they were going to get $100,000. And what happened? They both dropped dead separately from each other. Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5. And in Acts chapter 5, if, if you go to Acts chapter 5, 
Everybody travel with me to Acts 5. You can see, brothers and sisters, in Acts chapter 5, there is, and again, in all, in all my days, I never hear anybody really teaching on this. The Jew, Vincent, this is called lying to the Holy Spirit. Ananias and Sapphira, amen? And so you can see um, the fooling in the, of the people of God to make you all think I'm really, really good. I'm in verse 1 of Acts 5. But a name, man named Ananias and his wife Sapphira sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back some of its proceeds. Now that wasn't the sin. And brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. That's not the sin. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? Underline there, verse 3, lying to the Holy Spirit. See, that's a, a terrible sin. Now, remember in Mark 4, Mark 3, there's a sin against the Holy Spirit that you cannot be forgiven. So these men were trying to get out of their own sinful web. And as nice, why has Satan filled your heart? Interestingly, if you circle the word there in verse number three, it's the first time that the church experiences a satanic attack. And satanic attacks come through, the main vessel that satanic attacks come through is lying. Now, you know, it's interesting about lying, brothers and sisters, do you know you never, ever, 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 ever have to teach a person to lie? You don't even teach two-year-olds to lie. It, it becomes so easy to lie. How many can say amen to that? Now, I need to be on safe ground here. Has everybody lied at least once in your life? Now, is lying easy or hard? It's easy, isn't it? So now, underline there, verse 3. Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit to keep part of the proceeds of the land. While it remained unsold, did it remain your own? After it was sold, it was it not your disposal? How is it that you contrived this deed in your heart? Lying makes your heart get all corrupt. And then from there, it attaches other sins to us, will bring us down the mountain really, really quick. You have not lied to men, underline there, verse, verse number four. You have not lied to men, but you have lied to whom? You have lied to God. So lying is our father's, old father's nature. And the young men, uh, great fear, phobeo, came upon all who heard it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval of about three hours, the wife came in. And Peter said to him, tell me what you sold the lamb for so much. Doesn't it sound like a little bit like Daniel? You could hear the same kind of holy interrogation going on. This is the um, first time Satan is mentioned in the church. This is the first time that in the church, people get really, really scared. The first time ever. There's a holy fear at Pentecost. But this is the opposite fear of judgment day coming. Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. He said, yes, for so much. But Peter said, verse nine, how is it that you have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Underline that next. So we have the lying to the spirit and we have the tempting of the spirit. So again, we can see when, you, when we examine our hearts, these are sins against the Holy Spirit that we have committed. And what's the ultimate sin against the Holy Spirit is when you call good evil and evil good. Isaiah 5, 20. Welcome to today's world. So we have lying to the Holy Spirit. We have tempting the Holy Spirit. And we have the sin against the Holy Spirit. Does everybody have all those spiritual sins mentioned? Let me give you another sin against the Holy Spirit since we're on the kick, okay? 
Now, what's the fourth sin against the Holy Spirit? It's called grieving the Holy Spirit. That's in Ephesians 4. When you grieve the Holy Spirit, it means that you are representing God. It means that you're living in the power of God, that you are, uh, you just went to confession, for example, and all of a sudden you did something in front of everybody that, for example, you cursed. Did anybody ever curse in front of somebody? Not now, but you did in your old life. Save us, Lord. Save us, Jesus. So when you cursed in front of somebody and they all know you're a believer in Jesus, you grieve the Holy Spirit. So did everybody get all the four sins that we have against the Holy Spirit? Amen. How many know this is fresh information? Okay, so those are the sins against the Holy Spirit. But if you commit the sin of Isaiah 5.20, Isaiah 5.20, you will not be forgiven. You will be damned. Isaiah 5.20. And when Jesus was walking around with the Pharisees a lot, um, they were blaspheming against him. They, in my opinion, were committing seriously the sin against the Holy Spirit. Very, very dangerous. Amen. Because they were mocking the Lord over and over and over again. Do I hear? Amen. All right, everybody see that? Uh, verse 20, Isaiah um, 520. Everybody see it there on the top of your screen? Whoa. And if you went to Mass today, you heard the woes. Look at all the woes. Woes. Now, this is all this, trying, you trying to deceive the Holy Spirit. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light. How many think we're in a little darkness right now? And light for darkness. Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Verse 21. Remember Jesus said seven woes in Matthew 23. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes. And weren't these, weren't Ananias and Sapphira, weren't the men in Daniel 13 who are shrewd in their own sight. Woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and valiant men in making strong drink. You, you get, so watch again when you're being led into drunkenness. Um, and valiant men in making strong drink who acquit the guilty for a bribe, deprive the innocent of his right. There it is right there. There's O Susanna. There's O Susanna. So if you box in there 20 to 23, and you can see the sin against the Holy Spirit. So back with me to Acts 5. But Peter said, Peter said, tell me who he sold the land for so much. And it wasn't a problem doing the land. That was not the, it was not even getting the money. It was saying in your heart, we're going to do this, and you didn't do it. You didn't live up to what you're going to say. Anybody ever have that problem before? So please be careful when you start talking to God, and when, you're, when you start talking to God, you don't fulfill what, you're, what you would say. Whoa. So he says in verse 9, But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? The other sin that they committed was they joined together. They joined together in contriving their lives against God. And listen, the feet of those that have buried your husband are at the door. They will carry you out. Immediately, Uthos, she fell down on his feet and died. When the young men came in, they found her dead. They carried her out and buried her beside now, this is the first time 
Acts 5, verse number 11. This is the first time Satan is mentioned. This is the, the first time of the sins of the Holy Spirit are mentioned. And this is uh, the first time that we have, verse 11, phenomenal fear came upon everybody. So how would you like to be following Jesus, verse 11, and all of a sudden people are dropping dead right in front of you for not really making it, um, how, and the truth of who the Holy Spirit is. Imagine that happening to you. This is not good church. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. And the word things there mean the great events of God, the great events of the Lord. So we looked at now the sins against the Holy Spirit. And brothers and sisters, please do not be naive. It can be very, very easily done. And when, when I'm with a lot of people and they shout out certain words and say certain things, I just, I back off to myself and I say, whoa, 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 are they in dangerous, dangerous predicament right there. Whoa, whoa, and whoa. Okay, back with me to Daniel 13. In Daniel chapter 13, we go down to verse 16. Can everybody see with me why the church uses this during Lent? Because the week before Holy Week, it's a week where people keep condemning Jesus. And so we read the entire chapter. And of course, I think this chapter goes over most people's head. Verse 16. Then all these sound of the Kahal shouted loudly and blessed God who saves those who hope in him. And then they rose against the two elders, for out of their mouths Daniel had convicted them bearing false witness. Now, what commandment is that? Now, a lot of times, uh, of course, one of the eight commandments, we would think that's okay. You can never bear false witness against anybody. And you know, when you get older, what do I discover is the main sin of those senior citizens that I hear about. The main sin is gossiping and talking about people. Nobody here ever gossiped before, did you? Don't you like to tell a good, juicy story? Okay, a good, juicy steak. Hmm, so now we just love to tell juice, baby. What happens here, verse 62, and they did to them as they wickedly planned to do to their neighbors, acting in accord with the law of Moses and put them to death. The innocent blood was saved that day. And Hilkiah and his wife praised God for their daughter, Susanna, got him back. So now, what are we supposed to do when we're accused? Stay the court. Now, it's gonna be very hard for us to absolutely defend ourselves. Defend yourself by living in the calmness of the Holy Spirit. Is that going to be hard to do? Absolutely, yes. Now, we have two great examples. Saint John Vianney was accused. It's so hysterical that I'm laughing just thinking about it. That he, what he did was saying, okay, if you're accusing me, let me sign the petition too. He signed his own petition against himself. There's another person I think of, his name is um, St. Aloysius Gonzaga. And when he was accused, he said nothing. How many ever heard of St. Francis Xavier? 
when he was accused, he said nothing. How many ever heard of St. Philip Neri? When he was accused, he said nothing. So these are great men. These are great men who really, really got beat, but they did not stand up for themselves when they were accused because they knew they were innocent. So make sure you put your equilibrium together, keep your innocence together, and God will vindicate you. Now everybody pray with me that God will vindicate you. And Hilkai and his wife praised God for their daughter Susanna, and so, so did Joachim, her husband, and all her kindred, because nothing shameful was found in her. Now, if you, if you have grace inside of you, your grace will save you. And from that day onward, Daniel had a great reputation among the people. So Daniel has a great, great reputation of saying to the people, I will, I, I will give you deliverance. What's the deliverance? Through the wisdom that God shares. Amen. Now we'll continue with chapter 14 next week because we're going to start our new series blowing out of this on Ezekiel 36, Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 38, Ezekiel 39. And we're going to mention to you because of everything that's now presently happening, Gog and Gog and Magog. Amen. Now, on top of the uh, Masada, they sang this song, uh, Psalm 37. So we're going to get into very, very powerful teaching now. So we will go back to 14 for next week.